Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died in sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism and death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of light. Let's take for emphasis verse number four. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Just in case you didn't know, Resurrection Sunday celebrates the fact that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, but he did not stay in the tomb. He rose, he resurrected. So we are baptized into his death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, I need you to know that this was not a figurative, metaphorical event. We believe this is a historic occurrence that Jesus lived, he died, and he physically, literally resurrected from the dead. It was a miracle by the glory of the Father even so we should walk in newness of life. So just as we die with Christ, we are resurrected with Christ. And if Jesus is the resurrected King, then we are his resurrected people. This is the word of the Lord. I wanna preach today from the topic, why do I have to die? Why do I have to die? You may be seated, Holy Spirit. Take complete control over this moment. Father, we pray that we would walk out of here with a greater awareness of what Christ has done. But also, Lord, your word goes forth to provoke us to decision. Now that Christ has done something, the question is, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live in view of the reality that Christ lived, died, and rose again? Father, would you be lifted up in this moment? Would you use me as your preacher, your vessel, your messenger? to bring this message forth and may people's lives be changed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Why do I have to die? Which is part two of the 9 a.m. message, which was why did Christ have to die? That was the question that I challenged the 9 a.m. congregation with. Why did Christ have to die? We know that Jesus suffered a horrific death by crucifixion. Crucifixion, we learned this morning, was the most horrible way for a person to die in ancient times. We talked about the bloodiness and the gore of Jesus offering his life as a sacrifice on the cross. And I told you that in order to understand the crucifixion, you have to understand Judaism and you've got to understand the Day of Atonement. For Christians, Easter is the holiest day on the calendar. For the Jews, the day of atonement is the holiest day on the calendar. It's also known as Yom Kippur. And in Old Testament times, the high priest entered into a place called the Holies of Holies. And in the Holies of Holies, there were a series of ceremonies that the high priest had to conduct in order to forgive the people of their sins. He was the representation between God and man. That's what a priest is in the Old Testament, a mediator, if you will. The priesthood was a mediator between God and man, and so the high priest would go into the holies of holies in the temple. There was the outer court and the inner court, and eventually you would get to the holies of holies. And there was a big box in the holies of holies. It was called the Ark of the Covenant, and it was believed that the presence of God, his throne was in that Ark of the Covenant, And it had to be blood that was sprinkled on something called the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And that sprinkling of the blood was to atone for the sins of Israel. To atone simply means that that, that they were made at one again. They were reconciled with the Father through the blood. And we talked earlier this morning about the significance of the blood. Blood is gory. Uh, Blood is something um, that makes some of you wheezy. It makes you faint. It's not a very nice thing to think about the bloody mess of sacrifice, but we are all here because there's blood flowing through our veins. And in God's economy, 
the blood represents life. And so when there was a sacrifice in the Old Testament, that animal's blood being shed shows what should have happened to us, albeit we have a benevolent God who gave mercy to us even though we deserved justice. So in order for you to understand the crucifixion, you have to understand the Day of Atonement. You have to understand the significance of blood. Now, before the Day of Atonement was over, the high priest would have to find two goats. Two goats. The first goat was slain, the blood being shed once again for the forgiveness of the people as a whole. Then they would find the second goat, and the high priest would lay hands on that goat and then begin to confess the sins and the rebellion of the people. And what was happening at that moment of ceremony is that the sins of the people were being transferred to that goat. Have you ever heard of the term scapegoat? That's where it comes from because the sins of the people were imputed, were transferred to that goat, and then they would release that goat into the wilderness, signifying how now their sins have been forgotten for a period of time. But next year, once again, they would go through the same ceremony. And the problem was that people kept on sinning even beyond the Day of Atonement. To further make things complicated, not only did people keep on sinning, but the high priests had issues. They had difficulties with sin. And so eventually Jesus would come to be the final scapegoat. He would take on the sins of the world like that goat took on the sins of Israel. And he would be sacrificed once and for all. And his blood would be shed one final time for the sins of the world, which is why he came to die. Why did Jesus have to die? So that his blood would be shed to atone for our sins. And now in order to be right with God, we don't have to sacrifice bulls and goats. Somebody say amen. amen. We don't have to sacrifice animals. You can, you can, you can cut them up and fry them. <laughs> Some of y'all are going to eat some lamb a little bit later today to remember the lamb. But, 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 but there's no sacrificial power in that lamb that you got from Stop and Shop. Because the bull, the blood of bulls and goats can never fully atone for the sins of people. So Jesus became the final sinless sacrifice, the final sacrifice. No more need to sacrifice goats and animals. But now we trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. Repeat after me, Jesus is my scapegoat. Repeat after me. The punishment that was due to me was received by Christ. How many of you have siblings? I hope your sibling's not here, but how many of you have ever had to take a punishment on behalf of your siblings for something that you didn't do. You became the scapegoat. I need you to hear this. The concept of justification means that Jesus Christ takes our punishment and we are declared righteous even though technically we are wrong. So what you'll find in our humanity is that there's no way we can be perfect. No way we can get it right every single time. No way that we can be sinless in the sense that we sin no more. But because of what Christ did on the cross, we are justified. We are declared righteous, leading before God because Jesus became our scapegoat. And when you would release that goat into the wilderness, sometimes it had a propensity to come back. Have you ever tried to deal with something in your life, a sin issue, and you wished it would just go away, but for some reason it keeps on coming back? And you begin to realize that your own human effort by itself is not enough, which is why Jesus has to be your Savior. It reminds you of the fact that you need help, and that help can only come from Christ himself. The goat received the sins of the people. The technical term for this is imputation. Imputation is to take something that belongs to someone and to credit it to another's account. To take something that belongs to someone and credit it to another one's account. So when the high priest would lay hands on the goat, he was imputing the sins of the people and crediting it to the goat, even though the goat was sinless. 
when Jesus died on the cross, the sins of mankind were imputed to him. They were transferred to him. They were given to him, and then he died as the scapegoat. But after he received our sins and died on the cross, now his righteousness is imputed to us. The righteousness of Christ, when we place our trust in Jesus, is now imputed to us, transferred to us. When I was in college, there were a lot of times that I ran out of money. And I would call my parents, say, Mom and Daddy, I'm hungry. And they would go, let me watch myself. I don't know if there was a lot of online banking back then. <laughs> Somehow, some way, I would look up and there would be money in my account that I did not earn. I, I received credit. Right now, some of y'all want to go buy a car, but you can't because your credit is jacked up. So you need a co-signer. Someone who can step in and vouch for you. In fact, when they run the credit, they're going to look at the credit of your co-signer and hopefully the credit is stronger. Sin creates a debt that we could never pay by ourselves. The interest is too high. You know how some of y'all got that credit card when you were in college and the interest rate was 37%? And you thinking you could control your spending, you bought some stuff, you said, I'm going to pay it off. And you didn't. Then the interest hit, and then it compounded, and then you got to a place where you were so overwhelmed that you could not pay the debt. Which you, you didn't have enough money to pay for it. Some of y'all are praying right now for the forgiveness of student loans that you can't afford. You see, forgiveness is actually a legal concept where your debts are forgiven. The debt was assigned to you, but y'all praying for forgiveness that somehow the president with a stroke of a pen through a word will eliminate your debt forever. Then after it's gone, don't call me about it. <laughs> that debt's been forgiven. In the same way with the stroke of his blood, your sins have been forgiven in Christ Jesus, and now his righteousness is imputed to you, you ain't have no credit. Now Jesus' credit becomes your credit. That's imputation. His righteousness becomes your righteousness. Sometimes we think we're going to get to heaven and there's going to be a scale and the good's going to outweigh the bad. We will all be miserable because our bad, come on, y'all be honest. Y'all be honest. Y'all be, I know you saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, been following the Lord for the past 12 years. But if you're honest, if you showed everybody what goes on in your head, Y'all look good. It's Easter Sunday. People dress up a little bit extra on Easter Sunday. But there are certain things that the clothes can't cover. Only the blood of Jesus can cover. The reality is if it's based solely on our effort and our sins, we will not stand. We will have to hang our head. But a better picture of us is you're looking at the scales. You're bad always. You're good. You hang your head in reverence to the Lord, but because Jesus is your Savior, his goodness is imputed to you. So Jesus' credit becomes your credit. Now it's not a matter of whether or not you can outweigh your good with your bad. All you know is that the good of Jesus outweighs your bad, and so now you are getting into heaven. Your eternal salvation is secured by what Jesus Christ has done. What Jesus Christ has done it's better and bigger than anything that you can do. I'm here to speak to someone that's messed up so bad. Somebody had to drag you here to get here, and you just said, don't let me come, because if I come, the roof's going to cave in. The roof ain't caved in yet, because all of us were lost in our sins. He saves us while we're in our mess. That's how benevolent our God is, and he rescues us. And his righteousness becomes our righteousness. But our sin became his sin. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was the scapegoat who received our sins so that now his righteousness can be imputed to us. Romans 5 and 6 says, When we were still without due strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified, we just talked about that, by his blood, we have been saved from wrath through him. So Jesus on the cross absorbed our wrath. The punishment had our name on it, but Jesus steps in and absorbs it. He takes the bullet for us. He sits in the electric chair for us. He takes the injection for us. Because technically speaking, being born in sin and shaped in iniquity, we have been separated from the Father. And Jesus comes in, takes our sin, and gives us righteousness. And now we are reconciled with the Father. We can now be in communion with the Father because he sees the righteousness of Jesus on us. His blood was shed so that our blood can be spared. We could never pay the debt for our sins, so Jesus paid it in full on the cross. And this is what I'm grateful for that I will never have to die on the cross physically for my sins because Jesus already did it. He's already died for our sins and his work was final. You will never have to die on the cross to atone for your sins because Jesus has already done it. But here's the thing that I want you to walk away with today. We still have to die. We don't have to die a physical, literal death on the cross, but this is where it does become figurative to us. We have to die to ourselves. That the walk of the believer is one of life after death. Here's what I'm getting at. That we still have to die even though we don't have to carry the physical cross. We have to carry our cross. Let's walk through the scripture, Romans 6, 1 through 8. The Apostle Paul says, what shall we say then in view of what Jesus has done, in view of the scapegoat who took our sins, in view of the fact that he conquered death in the grave? Here's the question. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Now, if Jesus really has one victory for us, if his blood really covers all of our sins, and we are forgiven and justified based on what Jesus did versus our effort, some would say, does it really matter what I do then? Some would say, well, if my sins are completely forgiven, then technically it doesn't matter what I do because I've already accepted what Jesus Christ has done. And the Apostle Paul poses the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. The King James Version says, God forbid. Shall, how shall we who died in sin live any longer in it? So let's take a moment to talk about the mechanics of salvation. So we're here on Easter Sunday. We've talked about how Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead. He is the resurrected king. Great. Awesome. Awesome. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, that scripture indicates that in order for you not to perish, you have to believe in Christ. You have to believe that he is the son of God. You have to believe that he died on the cross for your sins. You have to believe that he was resurrected and he's coming back again. And as you make that belief, you confess with your heart, your mouth, and believe in your heart. Repentance and faith qualify you for the debt reduction program. If the president cancels student debt, there's still a process and application that you have to fill out to receive the benefit of what has been declared. You still got to fill out the application. You still have to watch this, acknowledge what debts are tied to your name. And over them to identify what needs to be forgiven. So when we are in Christ or before we are in Christ, we got to fill out the application. The, the, the truth is there, but you still have to fill out the application to say that I want that. What's the application? You have to be willing to acknowledge your sin, to acknowledge that debt, to acknowledge that you are sinful. That's the first step to salvation is acknowledgement of your sin. It's what we call repentance. Repentance is not just where you change your mind, but you change your way. You change the direction that you're going in. You change what you believe about what you're doing. And you say, I was headed in the wrong direction. I was living for the wrong reasons. Now that I've encountered Christ, I am turning and I am believing now in him. And I am choosing to follow him for the rest of my life. Faith and repentance. I believe that he is and I believe in what he did. That's the application for eternal life. 
So at that moment, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, according to the scriptures, you are saved. Listen to me, still smelling like what you did last night. When you do that, you are still saved, even though you still got that little addiction and problem that you came into worship with. You you are saved instantly at that moment, even though you don't know how to live for Jesus. Jesus accepts you as you are based on genuine repentance and faith. And at that moment of salvation, a few things happen. The first thing that happens is now God places his spirit inside of you. The Holy Spirit is what draws you. Not simply the persuasiveness of the preacher. It is the spirit that is at work through the words of the preacher working on your heart so that you are drawn, which is why during the altar call, you start feeling something that you can't fully comprehend. On one hand, you thought this was all a farce, but on another hand, the tears are real. On one hand, you grew up just thinking that was just religious expression, but in that moment, you felt something that was hard to describe, but you knew it was God drawing your heart. The work of the Holy Spirit is drawing you, and then when you confess and believe, you surrender your life, and then God places his Holy Spirit inside of you. At that moment, you are justified. Justification, you are declared righteous at that moment because you filled out the application of confessing and believing in him. At that moment. Justified, you're declared righteous. You now have new life in Christ at that moment, at the altar. And listen to me, this is why we share the gospel, because sometimes you hear it, then you have to hear it again, then you have to hear it again. Some of y'all didn't get saved at the altar, you got saved in your vehicle. Some of you didn't get saved at the altar, you got saved after you should have overdosed. And you woke up, you thought you'd be done, lights out, but somehow God blocked it. And then you realize that God was real. So, so you sobered up in that moment supernaturally to receive the gift that God gave you because you realized that nothing else could work. And you were saved. Some of you in the house of God, some of you outside. Some, some, some of you, you were walking, you were minding your own business on the street, and somebody came to you and shared the good news, and, and you felt that thing, and you received Christ. Some of you went to a, uh, an evangelistic event. You went to a concert. You went to a big gathering. Somebody invited you. You heard the gospel, and, and somehow you saw yourself moving up. At that moment, you are justified. God places the spirit inside of you. But after justification, there's what we call sanctification. Sanctification is the process of the Holy Spirit helping you to live according to the scriptures. You couldn't do it apart from the Spirit living in you, but now you have help because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and helps you to live right. Watch this. You came to the altar. You gave your life to Jesus. It was a sincere, authentic moment. People were praying with you. You go, oh, 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 be saved. You were so happy, you were so excited, you walked out, you knew your life was changed, but then some of the same things that used to get you got you again. Some of you went back to the same place that you were rescued from, but it was different. You couldn't just get down like you used to get down. It's because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, you went to go hang out with some of your friends. They're like, you different, you changed. You tried to do the same thing, but you couldn't do it the same way. You can't even cuss right no more. <laughs> As you're saying the words, the Holy Spirit is convicting you and saying, are you really, should you really do that? Should you really live like that? The drink doesn't have the same potency. You start to change because the Holy Spirit is changing you from the inside out. Some people ask, why don't you have a dress code at New Vision? It's because I'd rather the Holy Spirit change you from the inside out rather than to conform rules and regulations on your external because you can wear the right outfit and still be lost and desperate on the inside. I'd rather see people's hearts change rather than their clothes. And sometimes we think sanctification is putting demands and rules on people. Dress like this, act like this, go here. Don't go there, but what you need is the Holy Spirit to transform you from the inside. And that takes time. That takes process. That takes your entire life. The Holy Spirit begins to change you from the inside out. I love my holiness friends, Pentecostal folk, but that long skirt don't make you holy. Skirt go up faster than the pants go down. Did I step on somebody's toes? Them Pentecostal peanut butter stockings. Watch this are no match for the intentions of somebody's mind and heart because 
sin is conceived in your mind and then it gives birth to your actions. And when you set your mind on doing something, you're going to do it regardless of what your uniform is. What we need is a change of heart, not a change of uniform. We need a transformation of the soul. We need people who have heart transformation. And that's what the process of sanctification is. So now you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And now you have a different level of conviction because God lives within you and is now starting to check things in your life. Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Here's what grace is. Grace is God's divine enabling power to do on you, in you, and through you what you could not do for yourself. That's what grace is. I couldn't live right apart from Christ. But now that I'm in Christ, it's the grace of God that helps me to do what I'm supposed to do. You are saved by grace. You could not save yourself. So grace is in operation at your salvation. Grace is what saved you. You brought faith to the table, but it was the grace, the power of God that did for you what you could not do. You tried to save yourself, and it didn't work. You tried some of these crazy religions that are popping up, and it didn't work. Christianity is the only world religion that emphasizes God coming to man to make them right versus man trying to get to God through rules and regulations. That's the distinction of Christianity. We're the only world religion that emphasizes the humiliation of its leader as a means to rescue its people. In the natural, where's the glory in the, car, in the cross? Where's the glory in it? But supernaturally speaking, it shows the extent that God would go through to rescue those whom he loves. We are saved by grace. We could not save ourselves. So God, being benevolent and gracious, saved us through his power, not ours. Now, this is what I need you to understand. The same grace that saves you is the same grace that keeps you. So it's by his grace that you were saved while you were living however you were living and doing whatever you were doing. It's his grace that saved you. But now that same grace, enabling power of God is now what helps you to begin to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. The scripture says we can find grace to help us in our time of need. Grace is the outworking of God's goodwill, help in our time of need. So when we need God, we can ask for his grace to help us do what we're supposed to do. It's the grace of God, listen to me, that keeps you from cussing out your coworkers. When you're in Christ. There's a grace on you because you have been changed from the inside out and now you're asking the Lord to help me to represent Christ. And I know saying some choice words for this person does not represent Christ. So God puts the super on the natural and in the moment I died to myself. Oh, well, when I grew up, we grew up, we said what was on our mind. That's when you grew up, but you need to grow up again. You are born again. You are born again. You are born again. The old you was supposed to die. Why do we keep on resurrecting the old us, talking about we keeping it real? Last time I checked, any person that's in Christ is the new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. But we keep on resurrecting the old. Don't let reality TV fool you. In the world, authenticity is thinly veneered behind people just saying whatever they feel at the moment. That's not authenticity. Authenticity is recognizing that there is a power greater than you that is helping you to live according to his word. And authenticity is not just saying the first thing that comes to mind. Authenticity is filtering it through the Holy Spirit and being the type of person that can acknowledge that you're angry. But because of my love for God, I'm going to treat you differently. Authenticity is your ability to forgive even when people wrong you and to express that they wrong you, but because God has changed your life and because you've received grace, I'm going to give you grace that you may not deserve, but I've gotten grace that I don't deserve. And so I'm going to show compassion because compassion has been shown to me. Authenticity is I used to be a terror in the streets. I used to be a terror at night. I used to be a terror before Christ. But now that you've met me on the other side of salvation, you see something different. It's because I've been authentically changed. Where are the people who are authentically changed? Listen, the world doesn't need to see people who are trying to be like the world. The world needs to see people who are trying to be like Christ. And it starts with our heart. 
So it's the grace of God that keeps you. It's the grace of God that overwhelms you. You get a text message in the middle of the night. And you're wondering, should I or shouldn't I? The grace of God, if you allow it, will overtake you in the moment and help you to do what your flesh feels weak to submit to. Somebody say grace. grace. You can come boldly for the throne of grace and obtain mercy when you need it. But here's what I need you to understand. Grace doesn't simply overlook sin. Grace helps us to overcome sin. Grace doesn't cause us to overlook sin. That's how some in the Christian community have radically shifted to this place of radical grace where it doesn't matter what we do or how we live because the grace of God is so powerful. And one says, yes, the grace of God is able to save even the most wicked of person. Yes, the grace is that powerful. But, but, but let's not lock grace in the box. Grace also helps us to live right. So it's not that we can just apply grace when we mess up how some of us do at this stage of our life. We're getting ready to mess up. We say, God knows my heart. <laughs> we apply for forgiveness in advance. And God does know your heart. You still need to mature and grow and understand what <laughs> provision has been made for you in Scripture. But what if grace is more than just to get out of the situation for the moment and to, and, to, and to maybe soften the consequences of what we're doing? No, what if grace is actually an operation to help us do what we know we must do, even though it's still hard? Living for Christ is hard. Jesus never promised it would be easy. Jesus never promised that it would be easy. In fact, he said, you will suffer persecution. We really read what Jesus said. It's got to be a work of salvation because if you're just taking him at face value, this walk is not easy. It is difficult. You have to deny yourself. That's what he said. But sometimes we sell Christianity and we give these false hopes and we're so busy preaching prosperity and preaching that all your problems are going to be solved. That's not what Christianity is. Listen to me. You can make the best decision of your life and encounter the worst hell you've ever seen after making that decision because you're in the midst of a cosmic warfare between good and evil. And so the promise to receive Christ is not a promise of a life of ease, but it is a promise of being in right relationship with the Father. Which is why we need his grace to navigate the times that we live in. Grace doesn't overlook sin. Grace helps us to overcome sin. And too often we treat grace like car insurance. If I get into an accident, my insurance will cover it. All I have to do is pay a premium and a deductible and I'm good. How crazy would it be if you said, you know what, I have car insurance, so let me go get an accident to prove and test my car insurance. The limit is already on the paper and the policy. Why, why do you need to go test? Let me see if my car insurance really works. <laughs> Let me see the extent of how far my car insurance will go. You, you still might be covered. Watch this, but that doesn't minimize the damage that you experience. <laughs> I'm stepping in the waters now. See, see, you still have to deal with the back pain and you still have to deal with the emotional, emotional toil of getting in the car accident. So it's better not to get in the car accident and be thankful that you have insurance. Shall we sin so that grace may abound? Yes, the grace is there, but the ramifications of our, the consequences are real too. So you're walking around, your back will never be the same because you wanted to test your car insurance. There's certain consequences of our sin, and yes, we're saved, yes, we're sanctified, yes, we're delivered, but we still messed up, and we still got to deal with the realities of what we did. Here's what I'm getting at. Your insurance is not a license to drive recklessly, because reckless driving can harm you and others. So look at verse number one again. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Do you drive intentionally, recklessly, so you can get into a car accident to demonstrate how much your car insurance policy can cover? God forbid, certainly not. So here's what I'm getting at. Jesus died so we could be in right relationship with the Father. That's a good thing because his mercy and his grace is in operation. But there's a response from our heart that I think sometimes we miss because we get caught up in religion. 
It's very religious to come to service on Easter because that's what you do. It's what good Christians do, good Christian folk. You go to Easter on Sunday, you sing the songs about, revel- you, know, uh, you know, resurrection, it's all good. Then you go eat and have Easter dinner. But what if God wants to change your life in this moment? What if the power of the cross should move you to a more powerful life? The question is, now that what Jesus has done is finished, what are we supposed to do? And here's what I'm getting at. We live in a culture that encourages people to live recklessly. And that spirit of recklessness has even crept into the church. I've taught this time and time again at New Vision that our culture has a problem with hedonism. Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure as the chief aim of life. A hedonist pursues pleasure above all. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. If it feels good to you, go for it. That is the principle of hedonism. I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. That's the principle of hedonism, and that mindset has even crept in the church. But the question is, will you embrace hedonism or holiness? Remember, holiness is not the length of your skirt or whether or not you wear makeup or whether or not you preach with a black suit, white shirt, dark tie, holiness is your desire to please the Lord. So a true Christian will set aside their pursuit of pleasure for the greater pursuit of pleasing the Lord. Ah, you got to hear what I'm saying. Sometimes Christianity looks like doing the thing that you don't want to do because you love God more than what you want to do. That's when Christianity gets real. But yet what we want to do in our culture is we want to fashion plastic and metal gods after our own desires. Which is why we have this buffet mentality with spirituality. I'm at the stage in my life, I want to be as specific as I can about what I believe because just being spiritual ain't enough. Demons are spiritual. Spirit beings in the unseen world, let's clarify who we talking to and what we're talking about. And everybody has the right to believe what they want to believe, but I've got to be, i got to be how some of y'all say, Pacific. <laughs> I have to be specific about who I'm praying to because I believe something specific about Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross. That was a specific work by a specific man with a specific goal, and I serve a specific God. So, so, so why is this important? Because... We have to be countercultural. And in today's society, people have put their pursuit of pleasure above all. But that's not the purpose of following Christ. What if Jesus allowed the pain of the cross to deter him from going? What if Jesus allowed the jeers of the crowd? To say, no, nah, it, ain't, it ain't worth it. Palm Sunday, the same people who cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, were the same people who cried, crucify him. That'll mess with you, won't it? Same people I came to save, one minute they love me, next minute they hate me. One day they're happy because I'm hooking them up with some bread and some fish. Next day they want to kill me. Knowing the agony and the pain of the cross, if he chose pleasure over purpose, then we would still be lost in our sins. The world wants the crown without the cross. Isn't that what the devil presented to Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness? He presented the crown without the cross. He said, all you got to do is just jump over this hill. You know, this cliff, you know that according to the Old Testament, the angels will keep charge over you and they have an obligation He was testing Jesus to take the crown without the cross. And we live in a world, people want the crown, but they don't want the cross. They want success, but they reject suffering. And we have conveniently forgotten that Jesus told us to pick up our cross and follow him. That part of following Jesus is what we call self-denial. So the writer says in verse number three, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, now, now, here's what you got to see. If you suffer with him, then you reign with him. 
uh, whenever there's the founding of a company, the founders invest their blood, their sweat, and their tears. And there's a reason why they get equity on the front end. Because when the company blows up, they get to partake in the spoils of the glow up. And what I'm trying to help you understand is that when you become partakers of suffering with Christ, that there is a glorious resurrection, that there is a glorious reward for those who are willing to suffer with him. We shall also reign with him. We shall be, according to verse 5, in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. Christ had to die. Therefore, I have to die. Christ died a physical death on the cross. We have a metaphorical cross that we must carry. Christ was crucified to become the scapegoat for the sins of the world. We must crucify our flesh daily and die to ourselves to truly follow him. And dying to ourselves is the only way we can be free from the pattern of sin. And the apostle Paul communicated it this way, that we have to die to ourselves daily. Christ had to die and so do I. So why do you have to die? Because Christ died for you. How do you have to die? Well, first off, if you're not saved and you're far from God, you need to be born again. That's through faith and repentance and receiving the gift of salvation, acknowledging what Jesus did on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and surrendering your life to the Lord. That's the first death. We're going to have baptism in a couple of Sundays. We take people under the water and we bring them up. Every baptism service, I say this, there's nothing special about the water. It's not water imported from Israel. That's just good old-fashioned Bridgeport tap water. But the symbolism is what's powerful. When a person goes under the water, it is a public acknowledgement that they have died to themselves. And it's a public acknowledgement that they are resurrected in Christ. The old me goes down in that water. The new me comes up with Christ. Anyone that's in Christ is a new creature. The old has gone and the new has come. And I believe that in today's society, we need more people that are willing to die to themselves. We need people who are born again. New Vision is at the forefront in this city of youth programming, grants, all types of things that we do for the community. We believe in that. But I need you to hear something. The grant program is not going to save a soul. It can deal and address with some societal issues, but the reality is that people need Jesus for real. Because when Jesus gets the heart of someone in the streets, they have no choice but to put their guns down. Because they've been redeemed from the inside out. Soul transformation is what we need in this hour. And you can throw as much funding as you want. You can throw as many programs as you want at the issues of society and things will continue to get worse because what we have is a sin issue. But Jesus is the sin solution, which is why as long as there is breath in my body, I will continue to proclaim him as the savior of the world because that's what people ultimately need. We need Jesus. And if more people lived according to his ethics, what he truly preached, not a lot of this mess that we get caught up in, in the quote-unquote institutional church and all of that stuff. Yes, there have been many abuses of the church, but the church is still here because God's bride is still here and he's still working. And there are still authentic people who are just trying to live for him. I want to demonstrate a transformed life and allow that grace to operate in them so that people can see that Jesus is indeed real. And most times people struggle because they don't see people who have truly died to themselves. But when they see a people that have died and resurrected, 
they're finally able to embrace the truth of what we have to say because they see the truth working in us. And once again, the truth is that all of us have to die to be born again. Nicodemus, one of the religious rulers, came to Jesus in the dead of the night, began to ask him questions about what Jesus was teaching. And Jesus told him, first, you must be born of the water, then of the spirit. You must be born again. Nicodemus scratched his head and said, can a man, and he was using philosophy, go back into their mother's womb? No. The reality is we are born first of the water. When your mama gave birth to you, her water broke. You came out of her womb. But yet you must be born again now by the spirit. New life is what we see. And that's why Jesus died so that we can be born again. Somebody say born again. As we stand to our feet, the worship team is coming.